Um, okay, guys, I'm going to lead off uh, talking about virtual teaching. And my piece of this is going to be just to talk a little bit about uh, the environment uh, in which you record yourself, whether you're on the teaching side or the student side of a, of a session. Presumably, uh, all of you guys will, will find yourselves teaching if you're not already virtually. And I, and I presume all of you have already been students in lessons. Um, what really easily is overlooked uh, in setting up the environment is the need to find a space that's not boomy or reverberant. That's very hard for a microphone to decode. And uh, so if you can find a space that's relatively dry and, and free of reverberation, and if there are drapes in a room, uh, all so much the better. And, and of course, it has to be a room in which you can maintain quiet. And uh, that's not always compatible with a larger room because larger rooms tend to work a little better also. Um, but uh, backs to walls, uh, non-boomy spaces, maybe not making, making your uh, recording side of it in a bathroom, maybe much better in a bedroom where you have a lot of drapery and bedding and that kind of thing. Um, and it's worth searching out a good space to do it uh, now that we know that we have to keep doing a lot of this for a while. Um, and anyway, there are things about this, the virtual environment teaching wise that, that we're probably all finding are useful and we will retain once we're done necessarily having to social distance for lessons and everything. So it, it behooves us all to learn, learn how to do it as well as we can. So those words about the environment, search for a good, quiet, reliable space that's not boomy. And uh, it's funny how many of my, my own students I've had to tell, can you find a space in your home that's, that's not as echoey as that? Feels better for us to play in resident rooms, much, much harder to record in them. Um, then just a few quick things about equipment and my colleagues will jump in. It helps a ton to have an external mic. It's actually not important that it be the most expensive mic you can buy. However, there are differences. Uh, the, main, the main thing is that you need to have a cardioid mic, and ideally you need a mic with things that you can adjust. Uh, and the key things that you need to be able to adjust are if there's a narrow wide setting, a polarity setting, you want to have the, the narrow wide setting set to the narrow end of the spectrum. Uh, you want to have the, if there's a limiter setting, you'll want to have the limiter turned off. Because uh, while a limiter is great when you're trying to record for playback in a car speech, so you don't have to move the volume up and down while you're driving, for, for music where we're trying to enhance a dynamic range and convey that, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty important to have the limiter off or you'll be cutting out intermittently and it'll be very hard. If you've heard that situation with internal microphones and the sound cutting in and out, a lot of times that's caused by the limiter, not just the, the upload problems that we're having with, with bandwidth. Um, and we'll have other discussion about that from the others later. So if you can remember, turn the limiter off, turn turn the polarity to narrow or, or nearly the narrowest setting, set the microphone maybe 18 inches away from you. And here's a, nut, a neat trick to know. If you can, if, you're, if your mic is on a stand of any kind at all, if you can put that stand on something soft or flexible, it'll eliminate vibration getting through it, you you'd be astonished how much intermittent noise gets through if, if, the, if there's any vibration under a microphone so that's another just neat little trick to know and and uh, there is a guide with much of this stuff rendered that uh, I posted into the into the uh, all of the documents for the for the festival and if anybody ever has any further questions I'm happy to answer um, specific equipment now we can sort of dive in together. I'm using uh, something from Sure called the MV88, which I like a lot. It has an app that goes into your iPhone or your Android, and it has uh, appropriate cables to attach to either. And that app is very, very useful and, and allows you to tweak the settings and experiment a little bit. It's a cardioid mic, like I'm suggesting you need. But there's a lot of other products out there, and my colleagues here are using, and you guys are all probably using different ones too. Um, maybe, maybe you guys want to jump in with talking about the microphones that you've used. 
Uh, sure, sure. Um, uh, right now, I mean, I'm hooked into my a AKG Lyra mic, which is what I'm using actually to do my virtual lessons. Um, it's a, it's about a hundred and nineteen dollar microphone. It is suspended above me right now because when I'm teaching. Um, uh, I can back up a little bit like you know this and be able to play and it's it's more than an arm's uh, distance from me um, and you can kind of hear I don't I think it might be clear change my microphone um, and now I'm on the um, the internal mic from the uh, computer which probably has a kind of a narrow tinny sound to it um, and then I do have a blue snowball which Let's see. So I'm on the blue snowball now. They, these all have kind of different sounds to them. Um, and what I also found, for those of you who have headphones, uh, I know I see uh, Mike and uh, I think Stefan's got headphones on. He's, he's got this cool virtual. Um, if you uh, use uh, headphones, there's a different input. And, and it actually has a bit of a different sound than just straight up out of the computer. So, so. M Mike, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, are you using a windscreen on your microphone on any of them? I, I have a pop filter on uh, for right. the AKG. Yeah. Um, these, are, these are, if you have them folks, those are important, especially for anything spoken. Uh, it, yeah. it, what it does is minimize what's called plosives. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, that helps a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's so, great. this is like 20 bucks, I think, you know, 20 bucks on a hundred yeah. dollar mic. So, yeah. The MV88 comes just, as you can see here, with just a little snowball on it, black snowball. And that works really well, too. If you take that off, it definitely, uh, you get a lot more consonant pop. Right, right. Um, and, you know, one of the things, if you're, if you're sharing a microphone, that's a great thing to have because you don't have to disinfect the microphone you can just disinfect the pop filter um so it, you, you know there's always a concern about damage to to um your microphone if you're cleaning it with something whereas the peep, the pop filter is is easily clean i know alice has a different microphone that you've tried yes i do can you hear me okay so yeah. this is this is an audio techna that I've been using. I just have it on a simple stand. And just like Stefan mentioned, um, I have a towel that I place it on so that it's not vibrating and it just gets a much better sound. Um, I've, I've found that whenever I do switch mics, because I've also tried the Snowball and that, that's a really nice mic, um, I have to go back to settings because it kind of, it reverts back to- It will default. They will settings, default back. That's right. Default, exactly. yeah. And I found yeah. that that it ends up being too low so that I, I'm already a, a soft talker. So that, that doesn't help me at all. So just make sure that you do check in with the levels when you switch mics. This mic was a little more on the expensive side and I don't think that, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just gonna refer to my colleagues. I don't think that you need to spend that much money on a mic to- You don't. I've, no, I mean, you don't. You don't get a really nice mic and just if you follow the guidelines that Stefan was mentioning before and place it on a, a towel, you're good to go. And I need, and I need to um, say, you really don't need an expensive mic. And for Granary Hall, we have the most expensive mics you could possibly imagine. We have, and I, and I'm, I love them, they're great. It's just, it would be total overkill for the upload speed of, a, of, of this. We would, I would never use it for that. So don't even think about you know, mics that cost thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars like they can. All you really need is one of these little cardioid mics that, that can be, that where you can mess with the settings. That's it. And you know, the, the Blue Yeti is also another microphone that's about, I think that's about $150. Um, you know, Blue, Blue has the Snowball and the Yeti, and I think they both work really well. Uh, is that what you've got, Mike? Yeah, yep. and, I, and, and I'm told that's one of the best, my, you know, sort of slightly better mics for the money. That's what people seem to think. It's a good USB mic, but where I do have to just slightly um, take a different um, tack than you, Stefan, is that when you say that um, you can easily out 
purchase your microphone quality for what your um, upload speeds are, the, the thing that can actually um, compensate for that is using an audio interface. And then you do receive the quality, you're, you get a higher sample rate if you're using for sure space that brings the upload speed back to to an appropriate place so i also i have on order right now it's of course back ordered like everything else but um i have on order two ribbon mics because for horn you need one in front one behind and then an audio interface and then that will take care of the differential so if you're using an interface you can use very high quality equipment otherwise and and, and for ribbon mics you usually need phantom power and all kinds of other things right so it's that's a whole rabbit hole to go down yeah. exactly um, yeah. Okay. Good. Any other thoughts on, on equipment for folks? Um, all right. Um, let's see. We were, um, Mike, you were mentioning, uh, talking about some latency and, and things like that and dealing with latency. Maybe since we're talking, we just kind of mentioned upload speeds and things like that. Maybe this is a good time to dive into that. Okay. So last night I woke up around 3 a.m. or something and said, all right, let me write down a few notes for this. And I got going down a you know, wormhole or rabbit hole or whatever you want to call it that I was probably up till 6.30 in the morning fascinated. So I'm going to limit myself to a maximum of five minutes, but I'm going to screen share a few things here that I found that are truly very, very interesting. One of the primary things about what I found that I think is very valuable for anyone that's doing education is that this a general sense of the technology and the science behind what's happening will absolutely impress parents who are paying for lessons to know that they know that you understand what's happening, how to reduce latency, and how to create the optimal situation for real time or as close to real time as possible is something that I can only imagine as a parent who pays for all sorts of lessons and stuff for my children um, would simply like be, make me feel like I don't understand a thing you're saying, but it's obvious that you're an expert in some of that. So <laughs> out if you feel like it, stay with me if you want. I'm going to very quickly screen share something. Mike. Just yep. if I could interject, would you mind just talking for a second about exactly what latency is to make sure everybody understands it? That's the first thing we're going to get to as soon as I pull up this share because it has definitions. So oh, great. I don't know if I'm share. Oh, uh, am I? I am screen sharing, but I'm screen sharing everything in the world. So hang on. Show uh, slideshow. Play, play from current slide. Go. Okay, good. So the very basic terminology. When you're dealing with bandwidth, that in terms of an analogy would be kind of like, so I work in Los Angeles a lot and I would say bandwidth is the number of lanes available. So a seven lane highway is a lot of bandwidth. It's the amount of room that's available to move information or to move cars. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going fast if you've ever been in Los Angeles. You can sit in seven lanes of traffic for a very, very long time. But, but it's moving fast right now, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Yeah. Latency has to do with the delay that, that um, interferes with that transfer. So latency in our kind of um, auto analogy would probably be a lot more like if there's an accident or something that's kind of like slowing down your progress. It's not driving slowly intentionally. It's something that's slowing it down. Jitter is a term that deals with the way that um, factors interfere with your network. And that can be everything from um, having another device on in the same room, like having your TV on in the background, which creates electromagnetic issues. Um, it also can have to do with some minute adjustments you can make. And we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail later. And then ping, the final one, is when you say you're pinging something to find out your distance from it and the return rate and all of that stuff, it's literally like a test. Your computer sends out a short, small signal and it's how fast that signal returns. So that's what that is. Now, really quickly to talk about each one, what it does and how it can work for you, bandwidth has to do with how the quality of your music that you put across the internet. So you know when you're like, well, I can hear time and pitch, but I can't really hear anything about your sound quality. If anyone's ever taught that lesson or been in that lesson, that is because you are not able to, or you may not have the settings correct, to have the highest sample rate possible given what your capacity is for bandwidth. The sample rate is how often the computer 
um, picks up and, and retakes information from the live signal. And so the, lo or the higher the sample rate is, the more frequently it's doing that, all the way up to hundreds of times per second. But if it takes too high of a sample rate, then there's a backlog. It has too much information and it doesn't have enough lanes to put it through your computer. Higher okay. sample rate equals higher latency. Higher, yes, that's correct. And we want low latency, but higher sample rate also equals more detail in and nuance in the sound, the dynamic range, the colorings that we're creating as musicians. So finding a balance point is, is optimal. Reducing traffic on the network is includes, if you have kids like me, making sure that they're watching all of their um, Netflix streams and YouTube channels and stuff in like 720 video, very low quality. I don't really care what SpongeBob looks like for them if I'm in the middle of giving a horn lesson, you know what I mean? So making sure you're doing that kind of stuff, turning off anything, including your cell phones, GPS, um, anything that's working off of your network in your house can be draining heavily against your bandwidth, um, things like that. And then when it comes to uh, reducing your bandwidth, that can actually be helpful at times for reducing the, the way it goes forward. So if you have seven lanes, that can be great if seven lanes are moving really quickly. But if two lanes are moving really quickly, then those other lanes are actually extraneous at that moment. So there are times where as odd as it might seem, because everyone talks about or Comcast and whoever your network is says, well, we provide X bandwidth, whatever. There are times you may actually want to reduce that. Not getting into details, just putting it out there for your consideration. Happy to send this along to anyone that's interested. Then, when it comes to your internet speed, which we were talking about yesterday, Stefan, it's expressed as download and upload rates in megabytes per second. So the required or recommended minimum for most music lessons from what I've been reading and stuff is a 10 megabyte upload download. You can run speed tests, you can just Google speed tests and run them and get a sense of what you're doing. You can increase your speed by using an ethernet connection. I will show you a some, um, something in a second that will blow your mind on that. You can reset your router because the router actually can hold some information as a buffer point. And if you reset it, it clears that out and gives you faster speed. You can reduce the network usage, as I said before, tell your kids to get off the internet or your roommates or whoever it may be. And sometimes, if you are connected to an institution like your university or some other grouping that uses a virtual private network, if you go through that VPN, even with the delay from ping distance, you may still come out with faster internet speeds than what you have available to you in your own home. Now, here are three tests I ran this morning, which were just kind of interesting. The first is just my regular Wi-Fi connection, and I have very good internet. Like, I'm very lucky. Yeah, boy, that, I, I'm, I'm envious of your upload speed. Well, yeah, so the upload speed is very important for um, real-time collaboration or for anything we're doing, right? But if you look at this, this is over my Wi-Fi connection. That download speed is 495 uh, megabytes per second. Then I plugged into the Ethernet port and all of a sudden it basically doubled my download speed which means that the rate at which i'm hearing information coming from a student is as fast as i could possibly be which is good that means any any latency issues are more likely on their end right then so these are really high numbers like really good we pay a lot for internet oops we we have really good internet but the last one over here that has this is what i did with my vpn through the university of colorado the download is 69 and i can't quite see because all of you are in my way right now. Ah, sorry. 37. 37, thank you. 37 change. So that, whoops. So that 37 is still relatively quick compared to some people's normal. And so going through your university may also be helpful. So try out some A lot of, just, just for comparison, a lot of you, if you can go to do a free speed test online. A lot of you will find that you're not even up to four on upload speed. Right, which is where then 37 looks pretty good, especially if right. you have a VPN through your student fees and all of that stuff. Good. Next, latency. First of all, when we're all having normal concerts, we experience latency all the time. At least the horn players do. See, the meat is literally that kind of um, delay 
in anything happening. So horn players constantly are playing ahead of the beat because we have our bells facing backwards. We're reflecting off a wall. If you're in a big hall, if you've ever played um, the Britain War Requiem and you've been in the chamber orchestra versus in the large orchestra, any of those are all examples of latency. So in order to like create the fewest, this little um, graphic that I have in the upper right portion here, best describes kind of what latency does. As you go through more levels of stuff between your end and the other user's end, that's a problem. So on the left, happens with a laptop? You go through Wi-Fi, you go through your cable, you go through the internet service provider, then you finally get to, you know, whatever this is, the ethernet or the whatever, the World Wide Web, I don't know, whatever you're calling it. I, this is great for a tech class. Anyway, then on the other side, you have a direct ethernet connection, which goes straight to the service provider and straight out. So you've reduced your latency. You've reduced the number of levels you're going through. It's like um, in that movie, uh, A Christmas Story, when the kid is wearing the huge uh, snowsuit. You know, you don't walk as well with the huge snowsuit, which is like Wi-Fi and your computer and all that kind of stuff. So that's latency in like the very, very smallest nutshell. Then, did I miss one? No, good. The final thing I just am putting out here is a couple of things that we sometimes hear. The first one I put in because I was like, oh my God, that's why that was happening. I was making recordings at the beginning of all of this and I was kind of like, what's going on here? Why does it sound like I'm editing these? There's like these pops or these bumps and it was because my buffer rate was not good. So when you're using any of these programs, looking at your buffer rate can be a great way to... Um, if you have a higher buffer rate, that means then that the computer's holding just a little bit more information and smoothing out the flow. So check that out and check if your microphone requires phantom power. As Stefan just mentioned very briefly before, some microphones that are not USB connected require an additional power source. If the sound is cutting in and out, that's often a result of jitter. There are things called a jitter buffer that you can get as a software program that will smooth out the same way that your buffer rate changes in programs like um, digital audio workspaces. Then if your video and audio is freezing, increase your bit rate or use adaptive bit rate streaming because some um, internet providers offer that as an add-on cost. You can reduce your CPU load by just closing all your other programs and performing any hardware updates that might be available. If you hear an echo, I should have led with this one, put on headphones first. It could be an echo from what's happening in your live space versus what's going into your microphone. You can decrease your buffer rate. So it's funny, you increase it for clicking, you decrease it if you're hearing an echo, you use the low latency mode if it's available in certain um, digital audio workspaces, DAWs, and close all other programs using audio. Okay, there is so much more I could talk about on this, but I won't. If you're interested, feel free to be in touch. Great. Wow. Good information. Uh, there will be there will be a quiz, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't have to take it. All right. right. So we've, we've talked about uh, uh, room setup and equipment and, and latency issues. And now we should probably talk about some of the virtual platforms that that you are likely to be using. And I know Alice has got some information on that. I do. Thank you. So I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen and get to my little presentation here. Um, I, I realize that you're all familiar with these platforms, but I thought it would be interesting to hear um, what we thought of the platforms and what we've experienced as uh, teachers, professors. So let me get to this to view here. Where did it go? There we go. Okay. So, um, options of teaching platforms. Okay. Uh, Zoom, clearly, we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point. All right. Um, the problem that I've found with Zoom, however, is that it compresses sound quite a bit, especially high frequencies that I'm dealing with a lot because, believe it or not, I've taught a piccolo lesson and a flute lesson synchronously on Zoom. So, obviously, you have to change some mic settings. Um, which we'll get into a little later in this class. But the, the good thing about it is really it's the only platform where you're allowed to share 
information or hold a lecture like class or have a large discussion of 100 people. Um, you're able to share documents, you can listen to recordings with your student and it has the raise hand function, which can be really helpful. I actually taught a class during COVID while school was going on of uh, 23 students and having that function alone was helpful because as you may find there's this sort of awkward pause in Zoom when you're trying to speak or interject and, and add something. And when you're live, that works really well, but on Zoom, it just becomes super awkward. Um, also, you have privacy with the, the use of virtual backgrounds. This is not what, what where I live. Like we were saying earlier, I'm not a bug. Um, this is just a nice virtual platform or background. Um, another platform that I actually found really helpful was Play with a Pro. And this was started by um, a, a student who I knew while I was at Juilliard for undergrad, whose name is Adam Simonson. He's in Denmark. And the difference between Play With the Pro and Zoom is that it's designed for musicians. So the microphone settings are already compressing the sound quite a bit less. So the sound is just automatically better. However, if you don't have good internet and everything that Mike Thornton was just talking about, that goes away and it's, it doesn't even really make that much of a difference. So it's hit or miss. It just depends on, on both ends of the conversation. Play with a pro, you can't have as many people in the call. It's just face to face, two people. However, they're starting a new um, sort of design that's similar to Zoom so you can invite more people and it's available for universities, but it's not really for personal use because it, you have to pay money for that. Whereas Zoom, you do pay, but it's quite a bit less. Um, you're not able to share documents or listen to recordings with the student either. So that's a bit of a downfall. Skype um, is not compliant with FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, which I'm going to get in my next slide, get to in my next slide. But Stefan, you said that you used Skype in some of your lessons. Did you have luck with that? Well, mostly Skype is, is not good for what we do. But there have been instances, especially for me with students in Asia, when Skype was preferable to other platforms. I think it pays to know how to work them all and rotate through. There's times when FaceTime seems to work very well when people are having good cellular connections and they don't have good internet connections. There's times when Skype seems to work, work well when other platforms aren't working. I think it, if you're going to teach virtually, you, you sort of need a plan B and C all the time. So I think as a plan B or C, sometimes Skype is good and sometimes it's the best plan B or C and, and there is no plan A. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I did not try Skype, but I did try FaceTime with one of my, I have a couple of high school students in town and, and that I can't use that for any of my college students because that's also not FERPA compliant. Um, it just, for certain high school students, just like Stefan was saying, it's just a better connection. And there were times when I, I felt like, wow, I could teach like this all day. I can hear details in their sound. Um, I still feel like some, there are some students who prefer face-to-face, -face, but I was really surprised with the, the high quality. By the so, way, I think all of the algorithms do yeah. compress. I think all, everything yes. we hear on the internet is compressed. But I find that the FaceTime algorithm is the, is the most naturalistic when yeah. it works. I will just very quickly, because I'm hemorrhaging information that I've read this morning, Face do. FaceTime actually will give you the best quality if it's the platform that's functioning most effectively. It's now, I don't know about Play With a Pro though, Alice. That may use a very high bit rate, but the bit rate for FaceTime is like four, 41,000 um, kilobytes per second, and all the other ones compressed to 16,000. So it's right. literally three times as fast, just about, or as, as clear. Mike, do you happen to know for Zoom without changing the mic settings? Do you happen to know how, like, how compressed is that? Zoom is also, it's on that 16 megabytes. It's on that cycle. So, but, but Zoom is made to optimize multiple people to multiple, yeah. like 30 people. So it spreads that 16 over everyone in the session. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So I guess I was right. Good. My ears are still intact. <laughs> FaceTime is pretty darn good. Yeah, I like um, it too. 
so I just wanted to talk a little bit about FERPA. I'll keep it to a minimum and I'll send in our comments during after I'm finished blabbing on um, more about it because I, I don't think it deserves an hour talk or anything. But Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, okay? If you ever teach at the college level, you have to be aware of this at all times. And what it means is your institution gets funding from the Department of Education and you're bound to their guidelines. And all it means is you're keeping student education records private and that, that starts when they're 18. So if you're teaching in high school, actually their parents have access to the records. But now everyone here, I believe everyone here is in college, um, if, or at least 18. So at that point, your parents don't have access to your education records. You do. And that is because of FERPA. Um, okay, keeping videos and materials within a firewall. So a firewall is a program that filters incoming information. So if something pops up that may be spam or questionable, the firewall will prevent it from going through. So it acts like a filter. Um, this is why when I'm either teaching a class or teaching my students or my, my, teach, my students uploaded their videos for their, um, their jury, their final exam, they all uploaded it through Canvas, which is designed, that platform is designed to be FERPA compliant and it acts kind of as a firewall. Um, and using Panapto, it's just uploaded directly to Canvas and it's completely safe. Um, some students decided to use YouTube links or create YouTube videos and then have them unlisted or private, which MU, the University of Missouri where I teach, approved. I'm not sure how safe that is, and anyone can interject if they know more <laughs> about that. Um, about Zoom, however, with regards to keeping within a firewall, it's already helpful that I'm using a Zoom account through a university, but I have to keep the Zoom links private, because that's when you come in with um, people interrupting Zoom meetings and, you know, someone who's not invited. And that's why we use the waiting room and et cetera. It's a, it's a security issue. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, what you have to keep in mind is, does my university have a contract with this vendor? For example, my students suggested um, when I was trying to figure out what day to set our flute festival that we have every year, they suggested I use SurveyMonkey to figure out when everyone was free. No, I could not do that because it's, it's outside of the university cloud, if that makes sense. Also, I'm not, I'm not able to use Google Documents or Remind, which is another helpful app, but it just doesn't fall under that category. So that is FERPA. Um, I also wanted to mention a couple of helpful apps, and some of my colleagues here have a couple of apps that I have not used, but Screencast-O-Matic is actually a really helpful um, tool. If you're wanting to record kind of an informational video and you want to have yourself in the screen at times speaking, but at other times you want your audience to focus on whatever you're presenting, Screencast-O-Matic can be free. You can upgrade and pay a little money. But um, I wanted to share with you part of a video that I made through that. My name is Alice Dade. And I'm the associate professor of flute at the... Okay, ignore my annoying voice. So, um, this was a project that I did in a, a fellowship that I'm a part of at the University of Missouri. So, at the beginning, you saw that my face is there and I'm speaking, but then I can get rid of me and just focus on content. Why am I stuck to... We're still seeing your, your screen shared, Alice, uh, yes. with the platforms. We're not oh, seeing... Yeah. We're not, you gotta go to the screen share to uh, whatever. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Now you can see it. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So at the beginning of this video, my name is Alice Dade. You see me in the corner here. But as you go on, I was able to, with Screencast-O-Matic, get rid of the video of me speaking and just to focus on the bullet points that I appear, and it's just basically like using PowerPoint, but it has more options. Um, 
but I found that really helpful. I used that for some of my um, for some of my classes, and actually for studio class, it was really helpful. Um, and we'll get into it later on in this, but sometimes posting extra information or extra videos for students, I found that to be helpful because students wanted more to do, frankly. Um, okay, so let me get back to my presentation here. Okay. Um, Mike Thornton, I believe you listed Jam Kazam, and I'm not familiar with that. Could you talk a little bit about that? It really, it functions the same way as Jamulus and some of the other um, virtual um, real-time platforms for chamber music. And they're all called Jam Whatever because they were developed by rock bands, you know, to kind of practice one person in Seattle, one person in New York, what that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Cool. And what, okay, so Jamulus and Acapella, what kind of video editing software did any of you use for these kinds of platforms? Us or? Yeah. Oh, oh I use Final Cut Pro. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, and I've experimented well, anyway. with Acapella. Go ahead, Mike. No, I just it was saying I've experimented a little bit with Acapella, but not very significantly at this point. Do, do those do those jam programs do they offer a click or how do they help you synchronize what's the what's the system they're completely synchronous like they're in real if the latency is under 20 milliseconds on both sides of the connection it you there's no click you hear it in real time like as if you're in the room they're pretty impressive at at CU, we ran tests where everyone was on the exact same network in the same place, literally one studio away from each other, basically, and um, and on the fastest possible network. And it was pretty much the same as being right next to someone. Wow. That's cool. Wow. But as distance increases, as individual people's latencies increase, then you're going to be frustrated by lag and stuff. Right. Okay. Okay. Do, would you say, so it sounds like it's not really practical yet, right? Those, those things are not practical. Where it's practical is if your institution is saying you may only have two or three people in a room together at this point, and you have a woodwind quintet, and they're all at the school <laughs> in different rooms on the same exact server, then they can actually rehearse chamber music together during the semester. Oh. And, and would you be able to, is it, is the latency such that fast movement of Ligeti would work? You could do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's wow. really good. If, if it's a great connection and really only like research institutions and, uh, you know, f companies are going to have that kind of stuff available. Right. Wow. Well, that's all I had with um, FERPA and the platforms. Great. We had talked uh, a little bit about <clears throat> some of these platforms, uh, like in, in Zoom. I think uh, what, the only thing I would add to this is with, with a platform like Zoom, you've got to go through and, and make sure that you're using original sound, that you have your enable stereo uh, settings uh, set so that you're able to get the best sound you can. I think when you're a teacher, if it's a, in the lesson, if you're teaching the lesson, it's good to have headphones on. You get the, a much better quality of sound. I think anytime you use an external speaker, like I've got a great Bose little you know sound box, you get you get uh, delays because you're you're transmitting over Bluetooth and things like that. So and also uh, feedback issues sometimes. Right, right. So I know it's hard to play often, you know, if you've got uh, headphones on. So if you're if you're the one doing the lesson, I know folks will will put one one headphone on, you know, or one you know leave one ear available so they don't get the occlusion. Um, but you know, this AKG mic, the Lyra mic, actually has a a bypass function. You can plug the your headphones into the microphone itself and hear what you're doing. It's actually giving you the sound into mm -hmm. your ears, which I have found to be really, really useful. If I'm the one. The, sure, the, the Sure MV88 does the same thing. Great, yeah. So if you have an option like that, then you can put both both uh, ear pieces on and, and go. But even if you don't have access to high quality headphones, your regular cell phone headphones actually will improve that sound a lot. 
you know, so I think oftentimes when we're, we're doing kind of lecture format like this, not having headphones is, is okay. But if you're in the lesson, whether you're the, you know, the, the student or the teacher, having some good headphones is, is a real plus. Um, we did want to talk a little bit about some additional thoughts um, and open this this uh, forum up. It's about 11.43. Well, we've got about 20 minutes or so left. I don't know what, what time zone you're in, depending. So this might be a good time to move into some of those. And, and um, I know we had maybe some some ideas between the four of us as to how to lead, lead some questions on this. So um, anybody want to jump in? I know Mike, Mike and, yeah. uh, and Stefan, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think that um, we, the, the four of us talked last night and we've all shared that we're learning a lot about how to be increasingly effective in this environment. It's different than teaching in a room, um, but it's not all bad news. There are things that work here that, that are in some ways even transformational. Um, so I had one experience with a student I told them about last night. Uh, uh, pre-college kid, he's 13, he was preparing for entry into a pretty high level uh, institution and he, he had to prepare a tape. And what we started doing was having him just, just send his draft tape uploaded to a private YouTube channel to send me the link every night and I would just take the score and mark up on the score in, uh, you know, actually just using a, a another tablet-based uh, score reader and would, would email back to him the, the corrections directly on the score. And the virtue of this was he was playing a whole performance, which often we don't do in lessons. He was uh, then giving me material I could hear and review carefully at, the, at a much higher level of resolution than in real time. And then he was getting back for me a really uh, full and detailed roadmap for what to fix. And we found that by doing this repeatedly over the period of time, he, he, his, it really just absolutely transformed his preparation of that, uh, preparing that tape, which became quite good. And then he submitted it, was successful in what he was trying to do. And we've continued using that method for his preparation of etudes and things that he's charging through with, in a, as a supplement to his lesson. It gives us stuff to talk about in the lesson in more detail. So that's just one little anecdote about something I learned about this that I will continue to use even once I'm in the room teaching with students. Anybody else want to share things like that? Yeah, uh, uh, I think there are a couple thoughts. Uh, I had um, one of the things that you can also do is, is in GarageBand is to create a podcast track that goes along with in real time the recording that the student has submitted. And you can actually make comments um, and when you, when you download that, it'll sync those two things up. And so your comments will be in real time. Um, and then you can send that, that back to the student. Uh, also the idea of a recorded, um, whether it's, uh, I, I use Dropbox a lot of times or, or students will, will have a private YouTube channel is to screen share that at the either in, you know, if you download it as a, in Dropbox, oftentimes it will, will open in your iTunes. You can share your iTunes, and then the quality of sound is much better um, for the student, uh, you know, receiving that. And so you can actually talk together in real time while you're sharing the screen, you know, sharing the, the iTunes or whatever particular recording there is. That's worked well before. Um, written comments back, I think, are good. And one of the things that I've doing, been doing this semester is to actually have my students critique their own playing as part of the lesson. So make your recording and then write your, your comments about your own performance and send that back with the recording uh, because that gives us something to, to talk about in the lesson. Which, and I think there's something really beneficial to, to your own reflection on your lesson. So those are a couple of things that I have found it has been at least a, a benefit to this particular type of, of lesson. I'm stealing that idea, Mike. I love your idea of using GarageBand and it's kind of like having a coach in the gym, which I, I need in order to go to the gym and do the exercises correctly. And um, I've suggested trying this with a couple of students and they really like that idea. That's yeah. really, that's very cool. Um, if I can just add to that, um, what we do is not tangible. 
And a lot of times what I found was that my students wanted kind of a confirmation that they have improved. Because I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but during this time, my, my work ethic has changed quite a bit and also my motivation has changed quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so as sort of a prize, um, my students would record a shorter snippet of a piece or an excerpt and write down details of what, what they found, they heard or thought about um, in sort of a blog format that they shared with me. And then they would decide to address one thing in the next recording and they would record, record until they heard that change. So for example, oh, I'm, I'm compressing rhythms here and there. So being really specific, they recorded it, fixed it, and then told me in measure three, I fixed the compression between those four sixteenths. In measure 15, I'm no longer compressing that triplet, et cetera. Um, and they kept on going, addressing different things. And this way they could always go back to the original recording and say, wow, okay, I've, I've really changed this. This is great. So it, it acted as a motivator, but it was also something tangible. Um, so that's something that I've really enjoyed using. I think I'll continue to use that too, even when we are back to face-to-face. -to -face. Now I'm stealing that. For me, <laughs> we go back to face-to-face -to -face for me. One of the things that I know I'm going to hold to is um, using acapella or some kind of um, video editor to have students play an orchestral excerpt in all of the parts. So sorry to always default to horn, but since there are four of us, if you take an excerpt like um, Overture to De Freischutz or something like that, and you're playing all four of the parts and you're lining up with yourself, there's nothing more humbling than being like, this section is crap. And it's like, oh, it's all me. <laughs> um, and so I find that my students are learning quite a bit about the, the unique role of each voice in quartet literature and things like that. Their score study has become more meaningful because they have to actually make sure that the stuff aligns properly in real time. Um, and they are becoming more aware of tendencies of certain voicings and certain things that composers have written that we may need to compensate for. So I never did any of that before this. And I know that I will continue to ask them to play all parts to an excerpt because I we say to them study the score listen to recordings and yeah maybe they're doing it maybe they're not but there's no way around this if they have to submit all four voices yeah hands-on works better right sometimes yeah yeah a um, couple other thoughts we had we had talked a little bit about some uh, you know how to create meaningful uh, performance uh, opportunities, uh, some virtual collaboration projects, and and uh, how to promote uh, conversations and platforms and things like that. So, um, any any follow up from you guys on this? For um, creating virtual or real performance opportunities in virtual spaces. My students had a, uh, a master class this spring with David Cooper from Chicago Symphony, and they were like, we want to actually play for him. So what we did to reduce that issue, Alice, that we were talking about with Zoom, where it takes those 16 megabytes or whatever and spreads it out over everyone on the thing, what we did was we made the class public and we broadcast from Zoom to Facebook Live, because um, Zoom has the capacity to broadcast live to that. And we had the entire audience go on Facebook Live, and only the performer and um, the, the master clinician were on Zoom. So the breakdown of that was much smaller, and the kids were actually able to play in real time, knowing there was a big virtual, I mean, there were over 100 people because it's the principal of Chicago Symphony and everything. So there were over 100 people out there listening to them. So they had some heat on them. And the latency was pretty strong because we were using multiple, we were dividing it over multiple platforms. That's awesome. That's a cool. Yeah, really great. That's really great. I have kind of a, a letdown anecdote from that, that I'm, I'm impressed by that. But I'll, I'll let you guys in on a little bit of a trick that we've learned at Guarneri Hall, where we've been streaming concerts for a couple of years now. Um, we, it's often we don't do this, but with concerts now going forward that are not that aren't including a live audience, our plan is in fact to capture the the performance as a live performance in advance of the actual um, 
event itself so that we can upload it at a higher bit rate and it can be witnessed in, a, in, in much higher resolution. Um, don't tell anybody. We, we're calling them live events. They're, they're for sure straight performances. We're not editing. We're not doing anything to them, but it allows us to upload at a much higher bit rate. Right. Right. Virtual commencements. We're done. Done. Very similar uh, to that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, should we open this up for for questions from from everybody yes. else? Sure. Okay. You can throw it in the chat, or you can you can uh, unmute yourself and and jump in. Looks like we have one from Catherine. What are your preferences, thoughts about online doc storage and sharing, i.e. Dropbox, Google Drive, Cloud, or others? That's a good question. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. I'm lazy, so I tend to <laughs> just pay whatever it costs to use um, Apple's iCloud or whatever they're calling it, because then even if I want to send a large document and it just I can drop like a gigantic movie into an email I just drag it in and it says to me do you want to send this using Apple server or whatever and I'm like yup so I don't even want to upload to any of those other things and do so if you are an Apple person and you want or if if you're trying to decide what direction you're going with things if you don't want to invest a lot of time into figuring some of this kind of stuff out, I will say Apple makes it very easy and very expensive to um, to kind of like just do everything one stop shopping. And that's uh, the iCloud, Apple iCloud. Hmm. I do I do a lot of um, post production uh, work with a team on audio and video files. And for most of that, we tend to like to use something called Hightail. And, and the reason we like Hightail is just the way it organizes files and, and the detail in which it gives timestamps, um, which saves us a lot of time in the editing process. I don't think that's needed for most of you. Dropbox works really well. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I have never tried uploading uh, digital files other than texts to Google Docs. Does it hold that kind of data or not? No idea. I don't know. I've I've used Dropbox and in and for in a couple of different ways. One, I mean, that's where I keep a lot of my stuff. But also, when I was doing virtual lessons, uh, I gave each of my students a folder in Dropbox that was exclusively theirs, and they could just upload their their things, regular lessons, and and things like that. And it it was not a shared. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was shared between the, the the two of us, but it wasn't shared across the whole studio. And then I had an actual studio Dropbox, right? Where if we're going to do studio recordings or something like that, they could all just upload their their materials into Dropbox. So I found that to be pretty convenient. Uh, email is, and I don't know how it is at, at some of these places, but email at at, at my university is restricted uh, to the size of a file, um, and so. Audio files are too big for email. You really have to, yeah. and, and video files even more so. Right. Well, and, and we have to compress them so much to make them small enough to send that it's not worth it. Some of you have a file. Apple to do it, like, because you can yeah. just go in your email and it goes. Right. That's pretty slick. Some universities have a file, like what they call it, a file depot, a file sharing. And that's pretty slick uh, because if it's a large file, you can upload it and then somebody can just download on the other end and as long as they have the address for that. So if your university has one of those, uh, take a look at, at getting into that if Dropbox isn't available. Actually, even if Dropbox is available, that is usually – it's because for Dropbox, when you get into larger quantities, you have to start paying. And just like the virtual private network, if you're affiliated with an institution that has a large file transfer, it will give you the best speeds and the most space for free, I can guarantee you. Right. I actually use Box because that is the, the sharing system that the University of Missouri uses. I've used Dropbox before, like my cross Box, is describing Box it. works well, though. I use Box as well. It works fine. I find it to be really similar to Dropbox. It is. It's very intuitive, very user-friendly. And by the way, if no one saw that, that Kathleen wrote to everyone, Google Drive holds audio files just fine, at least small ones. Okay. Great. Thank Good you. to know. Yeah. Great. Anybody else? Questions? 
Bueller. Oh, no. <laughs> I do have one comment. I, I feel as if teaching online has, it's kind of um, made me think about how I teach and making sure that I can still be inclusive online. Um, as in, you know, I'll have some students who are introverted and when we're face to face, I have what's called a parking lot in my studio class. And it's a, it's a board so that if they don't feel the need to raise their hands and mention something, they can put on a, a, you know, a sticky note on the parking lot, an, either an idea or a thought that, that came to them and that just works better for them as they, that's how they communicate. And I've seen those students really do well during this time, but other students who are thriving in face-to-face -face, um, didn't do so well. So I've had to adjust making sure that the environment also worked for them. So um, it's been a challenge, but I think it's helped me just be a better teacher. Do you guys feel the same way? Absolutely. Uh, for sure. I I found that I had to reinvent a lot of what I was doing because there isn't the opportunity for an instant demo. Uh, you know, you can't just pick up your horn. I mean, you, you can, but, but um, you know, oftentimes when you're just right there face to face, you're diagnosing problems because you can see what's going on with the students. So, so finding out how to ask the right questions in a Zoom form or, you know, virtual format was, was, was part of the learning curve. Uh, and struggle, you know, there are some students who, I mean, we had to find alternatives for because they have terrible bandwidth because they're in, the, in, in uh, an apartment complex downtown, even though they're quarantining, every student is on at the same time. There are some folks who are out in rural areas who didn't have internet service at all, using hotspots or, or, or you know, finding ways to kind of circumvent that was all part of the learning curve, and um, and I think you you make a great point with 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 equity, uh, you know, and inclusion because we've got to make sure that everybody has this same kind of robust experience with their lessons, and it's kind of on us as the teachers to to make sure that everybody is is able to to thrive. And there's another thing about that, which is, as teachers, we're all relying on the feedback we get from a student to affirm that we're getting through, that they're getting the information we're trying to give them. In this environment, it's very difficult to develop a, a feedback loop where you're giving and, and receiving and giving and receiving. And with some students in particular, that's harder than with others. Uh, I, I think it's, a, for me, it's a work in progress, figuring out how to make sure that that exchange, the real time exchanges are actually delivering the way they do when we're in a room with one another. That's a great point. Yeah. Great. Yeah, the thumbs up only goes so far in terms of the feedback we're getting. Yeah, yeah my thumb's getting sore. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my finger hitting the thumbs up emoji buttons. Yeah, it's yeah, getting sore too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else from, from folks? Okay, well. I'd like to, like to thank my colleagues. That was a great session, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I've learned something today. It's great. Um, great. Um, okay. You're well, welcome, Jasper. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess what we'll do is I, I'm sure I think there's more, more to come in the day uh, for folks. Uh, um, so, so I hope to see you all in, in some of these other places. And uh, till next time, uh, we'll see you. Have fun. Bye for now. Cheers, guys. Thank Bye. you. Hey. Okay. Oops. Leave. <laughs> yeah. Bye for now. <laughs>